Uh, you may take a seat. And I'm going to direct your attention to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. First gospel in the Bible, in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1. But before we get there, we always have a question and answer to uh, go through every month. And this month's question is, what is the first commandment? Hmm. What is the first commandment? The first commandment is to, basically, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, don't let anything get between me and your face, Almighty God. And God says that to us because nothing else like God can touch the deepest thirst of our heart. Nothing like God can touch the deepest hunger of our soul. And our souls are hungry. They are thirsty. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, where you're from. Our hearts thirst for more. And God says, have no other gods before me because... Nothing like me can satisfy the deepest thirst of your soul. Well, let's go to the book once again, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and let's listen to the voice of God as he shares uh, with us the story of his son. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall give, call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and called his name Jesus. This is the word of God. Let's pray. God, speak. Speak loudly to our hearts today. Open our ears and our eyes like never before to see who you are and our desperate need of you and your wonderful love for us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever wonder when you sit out there what the pastor's thinking up here? And you're just kind of sitting there, kick back, laid back. Ever wonder what he's thinking about? Well, I'm not going to tell you because it's embarrassing. No, it's not. <laughs> I often think, I wonder who has come this morning whom God is going to open up their heart to hear the word of God like never before. I wonder who it is this morning. Would you like to volunteer? That would be wonderful. Ask him to help you. You say, you know, I don't get all this stuff. I don't get life sometimes. Sometimes things are just way too big for me, and it's way too confusing. You know, I don't know the difference between Al-Qaeda and this or whatever, but God, help me understand. Pray. Ask. that will open up your eyes and ears to see what is amazingly true for you and I. You know, Jesus was born, and when he came, it had been about six months after Joseph had received that dream. And it was, it was a dream. It was nine months after Mary had that visitation. And so I kind of wonder, during that time period, now during the birth of Christ, how many of those words from the angel must have maybe slid back into their minds, maybe almost forgotten, not the most impressive thing on their heart. Because let's face it, giving birth, ladies, giving birth in an animal stall, Firstborn child, a young Jewish girl, what would the most pressing thing be on your mind? Would you be remembering something that was said, you know, months ago? Or would those thoughts be, they'd still be there, but maybe tucked behind all the tyranny of the urgent, all that needed to be taken care of? I wonder what Joseph was thinking. Was he remembering a dream that he had six months earlier? All the theological truths the angel had given to him? Or was he just looking at all this thinking, my goodness, what are we to do? 
Where are we to go? What about tomorrow? Is Mary okay? Is the baby all right? Did we medically take care of everything as we're supposed to? Is the baby going to nurse? What's going on? All that must have crowded in. And that night, as they stood sort of together, lonely, we're not sure who was actually there with them, God reminds them of something. All of a sudden in the birthing room, oh, the birthing room, right, the birthing room, all of a sudden, in the opening of the cave, where the animals were eating and feeding, these shepherds show up. And they're saying, you're not going to believe this. But we were on the hillside earlier tonight. And all of a sudden, we were scared out of our pants. I mean, it was amazing. All of a sudden, these angels appeared. And they began to sing. And they told us that in Bethlehem, there's going to be a baby. And we can go see it. And this baby, he's going to be the savior of the world. And we're going to find him. And he's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And you're Mary and Joseph, and you're like, oh yeah, th those words were true that were spoken six months ago, nine months ago. And just in case Mary and Joseph might have forgot again, eight days later when they, they bring the little child to Jerusalem to be circumcised and have Mary go through the rite of purification, there's an old man named Simeon there. And he comes to the temple all the time because God has told Simeon, listen, before you die, Simeon, God told him, you're going to see my salvation. You're going to see the Messiah. And so Simeon's been there Week after week, month after month, mother after mother, father after father, male child after male child. And finally, he sees this couple coming. And let me tell you, they don't look like they've had a night in a five-star hotel. They look kind of worn out and kind of tired, kind of bedraggled. And here they come, and he takes their baby. And Mary and Joseph hear him say things like, the salvation of the Gentiles, the, the redemption of Jerusalem, and the fact that now that this old man can die and he can lay down and sleep in peace. And they hear all of that. And if that's not enough, about a year and a half later, while they're in a house, these wise men from the east come and visit. And they, they give them gifts of frankincense and gold and myrrh. And they hear that this one that they've birthed is a king. Now, maybe you're like that sometimes. Maybe the hustle and bustle of life, all the pressures of doctor's visits and, and this bill to pay and this appointment to be at, and you kind of forget what really, really, really is important. And maybe we're kind of like Mary and Joseph when the tyranny of the urgent comes in and we're like, oh yeah, I forgot that eternity is the most important thing of all. That the life to come is more important than this existence because the life to come is forever. It goes on forever. And wherever I'm going to be, that existence will not end. I pray the Christmas story will just open up your eyes a little bit more. We're introduced to a man, a righteous man named Joseph. In Matthew's writing, Matthew is writing to us as a converted Jew about the Messiah who is Christ the Lord. He's a converted Jew telling us that, yep, this is him. He, he's the Messiah. And he's telling us that this Jesus has come for the lost sheep of Israel. But not only that, he has come to bring about a world religion that has never ever dawned on the face of the planet. He tells his disciples at the end of the book of Matthew that I want you to go to the whole world. Everywhere that a human foot has walked, I want you to make a disciple of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It had been a long time since that information had been given to them. It had been a long time since Joseph had the dream. And I'm sure there was a lot on their minds. Could we stay in the stable? Where do we go tomorrow? Who's going to fund all this? And yet... The Lord provides the reminder over and over again. And Joseph must have remembered the dream. You're going to call his name Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. That's what you're going to call him because of what he's come to do. The doctrine this morning is the newborn Messiah. He will not fail. Notice, first of all, the person procuring. It's he. Whatever being saved means, whatever sozo means, whatever salvation means, he's going to do it. 
No one from the human world is going to be able to save like this one's going to save. Only this one will be able to accomplish what he has come to do. No one from the general population will be able to bring this sort of salvation. This salvation will come through the one who was birthed through the womb of Mary, who was called Heshua or Jesus, the one who can save. From Genesis to Revelation, it is God who saves. When Jonah was in the belly of the fish, you know, just surrounded by darkness and weeds, he cries out, salvation is of the Lord. It's he who can save. When Peter was walking on the water and he began to sink into the miry ocean, he said, Lord, you've got to save me. It is always he who will save. You will not save yourself. You're not the solution. You're the problem. I'm not the solution. I'm the problem. I cannot save myself. I cannot save myself from not keeping God as my first love. I must have him. And so when Simeon sees the little baby eight days after he's born, this is what he says. He says, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace, because according to your word, my eyes have seen your salvation. I thought he was seeing the baby, wrapped up in swaddling clothes still. Simeon says, I've seen your salvation. Saving power. I've seen your incredible salvation in the face of this child, this little one who has come to the temple to be circumcised. It is he who will save. R.C. Sproul died a week and a half ago. A great preacher, American theologian. And R.C. Sproul was ready to go. He wasn't ready to go because he was good within himself. He would tell you this. He wasn't ready to go because of all of his sermons he preached or all the books that he wrote. He said he was ready to go, and he really was. He had this great assurance that he was ready to go to glory because he was trusting in the righteousness of Jesus and not in his own goodness. He was ready to go. Would you be ready to go? Is he the one who saves you? I know it's easy to think, oh, this is a simple pastor. I've heard this before. I already know this. But how often do we as Christians find ourselves thinking, if I was only just better at this, then I truly would be a Christian going to heaven. Or if I was just able to fight this, then it's he who saves. You'll never save yourself. Never. Think of John Bunyan. John Bunyan writes this. One day I was passing into a field when some, he's an old Englishman, some, when some dashes of my conscience, fearing yet that all was not right with God, suddenly this sentence fell upon my heart. John, your righteousness is in heaven. I thought I saw with the eyes of my soul Jesus Christ sitting at God's right, right hand. There was my righteousness. There it was. Wherever I was, or whatever I was doing, God could not say to me that I lacked his righteousness because it was right before him in Jesus Christ. Moreover, I saw that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I already know that, Pastor. Well, Think of it this way. Did the Apostle Paul know the gospel? Did he understand that? This is what he writes after writing 11 chapters about the gospel that we think we already know. He says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how unfathomable his ways. His judgments are unsearchable. You'll never come to the end of realizing that this child must be the one to save you from your sins. You cannot do it. I cannot do it. Joseph, call him Jesus. Call him Heshua because he and he alone can save you from your sins. Second point, a salvation to secure. 
Notice it says that he will save. It's not a doubt. There's no question. It's not, oh, he might save some people, or, or maybe he might be able to, or, or maybe a potential salvation. No, he will save his people. When this Jesus becomes a teacher in his 30s, one day he said on the hillside, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but I will raise it up on the last day. You think, well, what does that mean? Well, Jesus fills it in. He says in the next verse, All that the Father has given to me, He's the one who sent, that everyone who beholds and believes the Son will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. He will. Are you one of those to whom He has saved? I will. There's no doubt here. There's no question about this. You know, people make it to heaven. They do. You think, oh, pastor, of course they do. We're all pretty good deep out down inside. God lets everybody in, right? Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible says, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are there who find it. Few. The righteous, it says, Peter says, are scarcely saved. We must take heaven by storm. You know, the first time I read the classic Pilgrim's Progress, I got to the end of the book, John Bunyan's, you know, great classic there, and I, when I got to the book and I got to the place where a Christian actually makes it into heaven, you're going to think I'm a sap. Well, don't think I'm a sap. I actually cried. My wife says I'm tearfully challenged because I never cry about anything. I just don't cry. When I finished reading that book, and Christian finally makes it, I thought, he got, he got there. He, he made it. He actually got into glory. And that's a fictional story. But people actually get there. We have friends in our congregation who say goodbye. They graduate to heaven, our members. We just said goodbye to our friend Alice Hamilton. And... Uh, Someone's going to be next. You do realize that, right? This should not surprise us. Do we have any volunteers? <laughs> oh, I know it's a scary thing. But someone's going to go. Someone's going to leave. And, and I try to tell them when I talk to them, when, when you close your eyes in death and you feel the death do grow in your, in your brow and you feel yourself losing the ability to hang on to your body, just look for Christ and remember that you're not going to be going alone. Because there's going to be other people in this planet who are going to be leaving with you as well. Who are going to be walking the same pathway to glory as you. Oh, they might be from Africa or from Haiti or from some other country, from Asia, Australia. But they're going to be going as well. He will save a people. He's not making them savable. He's saving them. It's an actual salvation. He actually comes and he gets them. He will save them. There's no doubt in the angel's mind. None whatsoever. And the idea of having to be saved by somebody outside of yourself means you cannot do it. You can't. Whatever it means to be saved, you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. Let me give you a story. I probably shared this before sometime in the past. When, when you're a little boy and you're playing with your friends, and you see a hole in the fence, what does the hole in the fence mean? It means you go through it. That's right. You go to see what's going on here. Well, we found a hole in the fence that led to the roof of a barn where I used to live in Bedford, Massachusetts. And we discovered that below the barn's roof, there were some large snow banks that a plow had plowed up. And we thought, hey, huh, instant, jump off the roof, jump into the snow. And so we were doing this. It was wonderful. You jump in. But my friend Chucky, I don't know if he weighed more than the rest of us. I don't know if he just hit a soft spot. All of a sudden, boom. Where'd he go? Well, he didn't go that far under. He was buried about up here and he couldn't get out. I mean, he was stuck. And we did everything we could as nine-year-old boys. We took all of our wisdom, all of our strength, all of our might, and we could not set him free. 
We just couldn't. We needed to find somebody outside of our childhood neighborhood world to come help us because we couldn't save him. So finally we found some adult, I don't know where he found this guy, but he came over with a shovel and he dug Chucky out. He didn't make Chucky savable. He actually rescued him. He didn't put him in a state of rescuableness. He actually took him from the snowbank and he saved him. You'll name him Jesus because he will save them. It's not a potential salvation. It's a real salvation. It's actual. I don't know who all they are or who they may be, but he actually saves those people. The difficulty I think sometimes with us is this. I don't think we think it's that big of a deal. Oh, yes, it being saved. Oh, yeah. It's kind of religious jargon. I've heard that before. What's the big deal? Being saved from what? And I think sometimes we forget the seriousness of the moment. I think we act like we're on the Titanic 30 minutes before the iceberg hits. And we all have this kind of ballroom mentality that everything's all right. Our biggest concern is, you know, my glass is only half full. What's up with that? I hope they have the, the bacon-wrapped scallops. Those things are so good. Oh, how Penelope would dance with me. Do I look okay? How's my suit? How's my hair look? Oh, gee, my goodness. I love that song. This is wonderful. Oh, let's count. Two, three, one, on. Happy New Year. And that's our concern. We're so wrapped up, and we don't realize that 30 minutes, that iceberg is going to hit. It doesn't matter what we believe, what we think. It's going to hit no matter what. And the lifeboats, those things are like just ornaments hanging on there. And life preserver? I'm not going to put a life preserver on. Are you kidding me? It's going to cramp my style. It's going to ruin my dress. And we act as human beings like death is not really going to happen to us. And that salvation is not that big of a deal. It's just a big religious thing. Don't worry about it. Well, not according to the story here that God's given to us. You call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The great New England preacher Jonathan Edwards said it like this. Humanity is like walking over the very mouth of hell itself on rotten boards. And you never know when your weight's going to snap that board in half and all of a sudden, bam, and it's done. It'll be over with. Whatever is, is is. Whatever comes to be will be. That's it. That's why salvation, whatever, whatever you're going to call him, is, is, is so, is so, it's so important to understand. You'll call him Jesus because he will save them from their sins. It may sound foolish to us. It may, it may seem childish or elementary. But according to this book, According to this Jesus Christ, salvation is everything. To be saved. All right. Thirdly, a people to possess. He will save his people. It's personal for Jesus. It's his people. He's coming to get them. Has he come to get you? Do you hear the voice in your heart saying, yes, you're mine. That, that you're mine. I've come to get you. Even C.S. Lewis said that he was not the one seeking God. He said he was the prey being sought after. God was coming to get him. He will save his people from their sins. Listen to the preacher once again, Jesus, this baby. Later on in his ministry, he says, All that the Father has given to me will come to me. All that the Father has given to me, they'll come to me. And those who come to me, I will never drive away. Later on, three verses later, or four verses later, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Oh. So he's not going to drive you away if you come to him by faith, because number one, you must be one of the ones that the Father gave to him. And number two, it must be the Father who's drawing you to him. Later on in the sermon, he begins to decide or make a, a test to say, who is really my children? Because it's his people. And so he gives them a, a, a theological challenge and says, unless you drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part with me. And Jesus discovers who are really his, because most of the people walked away. This is offensive, man. What's this guy talking about? We're out of here. And so Jesus turns to his disciples and says, are you going to leave also? And Peter says, one of Peter's bright moments, where shall we go? You, Jesus, have the words of eternal life. He's going to save his people from their sins. It was the missionary theological impulse of the great missionary societies in the 17th century that God had a people worldwide and so it wasn't a romantic vision of missions that sent them. It was a theological reality that, yes, God has a people. 
I did youth ministry for several years in New Hampshire. And it didn't matter to me if we had five kids, 10 kids, or 35 kids. It didn't matter what. All I knew was that kids were coming to the youth ministry from outside the church family, and they might be the one that God touches that day with His truth. You see, when a pastor sits up here, he's praying for you guys out there. That's what he's thinking. You know what he's not thinking? He's not thinking about the Patriots game. Because that's just a game. He's thinking about the ultimate reality. Who's going to be touched by the Word of God this morning? And some of those kids who come to our youth group, I still remember their names. Greg Ehrman, Chris Newbert, Trisha Murphy, all kids from outside of the church. These kids now are in their 40s and 50s. But maybe one of them was one of those people whom God had brought to the group to hear His words because He's going to save His people from their sins. It's personal with Jesus. And He's going to save them Finally, the object or the enemy subdued is their sins. So, I need to ask you a question. I love asking questions. What's your plan? How are you going to take care of your sin problem? What's your plan? I hope you have one. You need to have a plan. The sins need to be gone, forgiven, wiped clean. They need to be paid for by somebody. What's your plan? It's all over you. It's in you, outside of you. You were born with it, just like me. The infection's right there. It shows all the symptoms. I think we make a mistake about sin. I think sometimes we think that sin is just some kind of power outside of us that causes us to do, you know, questionable things sometimes. But that's not what the Bible says. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians. He says to the Christians who believe in this Jesus who came to die for sin, he says to them, you were once darkness... You are now presently light. Walk as children of light. He didn't say that you once dabbled in darkness. No, he says you were once darkness. You didn't get it. You didn't see, you didn't hear, you didn't have the light of Christ in us. So you didn't pursue these things. They weren't valuable to you. Everything else was valuable to you. Everything else, your, your personal comfort, some sports team, some prestige, some applause, something ate your heart up, but Jesus never did. You were blind. But now, you're light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. I think the second mistake we make is this, that it's not that big of a deal. That sin is not a big problem. Let me take you to the Garden of Gethsemane. Right the night before Jesus was going to be crucified on a tree. There the perfect Emmanuel God with us, Jesus the Son of God, is praying. And as he contemplates in his mind, taking upon the guilt of his people, being reckoned a sinner, he doesn't become a sinner, he's reckoned a sinner by his father, and he takes on the punishment due those people who will believe. During that moment of contemplation, it says that he sweat, as it were, drops of blood. And then, with venomous cries and tears, he prayed these words. He said, Lord, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. If that was the Christ's thought in regard to the weight of sinfulness, why are we looking at it differently? Why do we think that it's not that big of a deal? And then think of the biographies of Jesus, the biographies of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who spend most of their time, the majority of their time, speaking of the passion of Jesus Christ and showing us the ugliness and the goriness of death. The death that Christ died. Why? The Gospels could have said this. The Gospels could have said, oh, Jesus died. Jesus died, period. It's over with. But they don't. They show us the grotesque, gruesome, barbaric crucifixion of Christ. Why does God want us to see that? Because He wants us to see that sin is not that small of a deal. It, it's a big deal. And that's why it's Jesus Call him Heshua because he will save his people from their sins. Let's go back to the Titanic. Nobody was concerned. Nobody was standing in line 30 minutes before the iceberg hit to buy a ticket for a lifeboat, were they? No. Those lifeboats were being ignored. But 30 minutes later, you couldn't buy one. You couldn't have paid for one. There's a time when you got to realize before the iceberg hits, before you must give an account before the Almighty God, that Christ Jesus is your hope. He's your anchor. He's your peace. 
And by faith in him, he can be your Heshua. And you can say, yes, he has come to save his people, and I'm one of them from their sins. So I go back to the question, what's your plan? Do you have a plan? A plan to deal with your sin. Because you've got to get rid of it. And Christ Jesus is more than willing to make you clean. More than willing to pay. He's already paid for it. The question, are you one of his people? You'll know it by faith when you call upon his name. You must do business with heaven. That's why we celebrate Christmas. I know we think that Christmas is about buying a lot of gifts that we can't afford. But it's not. It's about receiving a gift that we could never ever pay for. It's the gift of eternal life. And he's going to give it. He who calls upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I know you know how to call upon things. You go to a restaurant, right? And the, and, and, and the wait staff comes to your table and you're smiling because you're going to be fed. This is going to be great. I don't have to cook. I don't have to clean. It's going to be, oh, this is going to be great. And you look at the menu and you tell the wait staff exactly what you want. You need to deal business with, with heaven and you need to tell Jesus exactly what you want him to do. Lord Jesus, I want you to be my hope of glory, the one who forgives me of my sins, and I want to follow you, and I want to know you, because I don't want to wait till it's too late. I want to call upon your name now. You'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Help us to understand it, Lord, if we're wrestling with it, Lord, help us to, to find your face this morning. Receive our praise. Receive our glory. Glory be to you in the highest, because you're God. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and pray in your holy name. Amen.